Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 18th Loyal Virtual Seminar. Loyal Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And uh, we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. I'm your host, Adam Getacho. I am the co-founder and CTO at Blue Health Ethiopia. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Hamel Malgabeyo here with us. Uh, Dr. Amel Mal is going to update us on the approach and management of AKI. Uh, to give you a little introdu introduction about Dr. Amel Mal, Dr. Amel Mal is an assistant professor of medicine, nephrologist and internist, and uh, currently serving as the head of nephrology div division under the Department of Internal Medicine at St. Paul Melinia uh, Medical College. Uh, I think this is uh, a little bit uh, into the introduction. Dr. Hammermal, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, so I will proceed uh, with management and approach uh, for patients with acute kidney injury. Uh, we will discuss uh, about uh, a lot of uh, topics here. Uh, one of which would be, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through introduction, definitions of AKI, etiologic diagnosis, which is as important as uh, diagnosis and uh, prevention and management of acute kidney injury. I will focus most of my time on diagnosis and um, prevention and management. So feel free to uh, write your questions in the Q&A section. I will answer as much questions as possible if time allows. Uh, so feel free to ask and we'll also discuss practical uh, things in uh, actual clinical scenarios in management with uh, in management uh, of AKI. So uh, to start, uh, AKI is impairment of uh, kidney filtration and excretion function, uh, it, uh, which results in retention of nitrogen and other waste products. Uh, normally, which should be cleared by the kidneys. So this definition uh, does not actually include uh, prerenal insult, where there is no actual problem in filtration and excretory function, like, you know, in prerenal acute kidney injury, AKI results from or injury results from lack of enough uh, perfusion to the kidneys. It's a perfusion problem rather than uh, an excretory function mentioned here, but that's also uh, included in uh, the spectrum of acute kidney injury. And some definitions also take into account what resuscitation measures or what hydration measures have been taken in patients with acute kidney injury. Uh, so AKI is a clinical diagnosis, so you don't need uh, further investigations or you don't need sophisticated investigations to diagnose acute kidney injury. An elevated serum creatinine and or oliguria is enough to diagnose most patients with acute kidney injury, especially those with risk factors. Uh, so Oliguria by itself, urine output criteria by itself may be a little bit controversial, but uh, serum creatine with other urinary changes like oliguria and anuria will give us definitive diagnosis for acute kidney injury, which is clinical, and we have to proceed to etiologic diagnosis. Um, serum creatine is not an ideal marker, but we'll discuss later on. It reflects JFR. Unfortunately, that's the only marker that we have. And you have to note here that some patients may not have oliguria. For example, patients with um, drug, in, drug toxicities such as um, antibiotic toxicities, interstitial nephritis may not have uh, oliguria. These patients may have non-oliguric acute kidney injury. Uh, so oliguria by itself carries a poor prognosis in patients with acute kidney injury. That may not always be uh, the cause, but some studies show that oliguria Oliguric AKI has worse prognosis than non-oliguric AKI. In clinical practice, we see non-oliguric AKI in the setting of interstitial nephritis, usually uh, antibiotic-induced interstitial nephritis. So AKI is very common in the hospital setting, uh, usually in the ICU. Uh, so there is a term nowadays called hospital-acquired acute kidney injury. Uh, 
which results from multiple factors. One is the underlying condition that the patient is admitted for. Most patients in the ICU have septic complications, sepsis, uh, and they are on polypharmacy, like common drugs resulting in interstitial nephritis. Fluid management may be very complicated in patients with ICU. Uh, the other scenario where AK is much more common than other settings is in post-operative patients. So post-operative patients, special patients undergoing GI surgery or any other major surgery will have very high fluid shift in electrolytes. So they are at increased risk of AK uh, than the general population. So AK is associated with long and short-term adverse outcomes and future risk of CKD. We'll touch on that uh, later on in the main uh, presentation. So it's not a simple disease that uh, it's not a, it's not a simple clinical scenario where everything goes back to normal. There may be residual uh, changes in short-term complications. Mortality is increased in acute kidney injury and the like. So current therapy of acute kidney injury mostly focused on supportive care. Uh, so we wait for the kidney to recover. So by treating the underlying condition, AKA is not a disease by itself. There are some exceptions, of course. So while waiting for the kidney to recover, we have to optimize supportive care. So by this supportive care, we mean there are different principles of management that will result in uh, recovery. And we have to protect the kidney while we are giving supportive care. Uh, so we'll discuss more uh, later about which supportive care are much more beneficial than the others. Unfortunately, specific therapy for uh, AKI does not exist. So there were many drugs that were tried uh, previously when we were students. LASIX was the mainstay of management for patients with acute kidney injury. There's a term called challenge with LASIX, give LASIX in the hope that producing some urine will result in improvement of acute kidney injury. But now we know that that is not the case because uh, producing urine, changing oligyric state to non-oligyric states does not affect the outcome. And there are indications for diuretics that is to control fluid overload. Otherwise, the drug by itself does not uh, change the outcome or treat uh, acute kidney injury. So direct treatment of kidney disease is possible in diseases such as glomerulonephritis, which is beyond this presentation, but in patients with glomerular disease, immunosuppressive therapy actually reverses the glomerular process and may have some effect on the interstitial process as well. That goes on in uh, many glomerular diseases, especially immune complex glomerular diseases are very responsive to immunosuppressive agents. The other is thrombotic microangiopathy resulting in AKI. If the cause of AKI is TMA, uh, there are options, plasma pharesis and uh, immunosuppressive immunomodulatory medications. Malignancy associated AKI, very difficult to treat, but some uh, AKI may improve. For example, uh, some hematologic malignancies, in my, including myeloma, there is specific treatment for the uh, condition that causes the acute kidney injury. So, but for the, unfortunately, for the rest of the uh, cause of AKI, only supportive care is there in treating the underlying cause, the risk factor, and then renal recovery will be there or not, depending on the patient's clinical scenario. So incidence of AK, this is a relatively older slide. So all the uh, a relatively older picture. So all the pictures and uh, tables or uh, other graphs that I've used in this uh, PowerPoint, I have uh, shared also in the same slide, the references. So anybody, uh, when we share the uh, PowerPoint, you'll get the references so far as the reading is possible. So this is relatively older. Some things may have changed, but unfortunately, still there is not enough data uh, or large study to suggest uh, the true incidence of acute kidney injury in Africa. There are some studies in uh, East Africa in retroviral infected patients, also in Northern Africa. There are studies, but there is no large uh, study Pulled, uh, with pulled data to suggest acute kidney injury. So like you see here, there is the significant regional variation in South America, for example, rates of AKI reach up to 30%. And in Southern uh, Europe, or um, also it's 31%. In Eastern Asia, the rate of AKI is small. Uh, we don't know the reason, but they have aggressive screening programs in, uh, for patients, uh, for school children, and they have um, vigilant uh, 
screening strategies, but I'm not sure that's uh, reflective of the number here, but it's reported in Northern Europe and Eastern Asia. There is relatively low uh, in incidence of acute kidney injury studies in our country are very old. They're, most of them are in the 80s. Uh, I couldn't find any strong study to suggest which is representative of the country's demographics. So one area maybe uh, it's better to consider by physicians maybe attending here to study the country's AKI status. So in Africa, the studies are not that much uh, representative. So here you can see it can reach from 15 to 30 percent depending on the population studied. So the other thing I want to focus on in this study in this uh, uh, discussion is that AKI is a systemic illness. So most physicians assume that AKI is a local process that only affects the kidneys and uh, does not go anywhere else. But we now know that the inflammatory mechanisms during acute kidney injury may have effects not only in the kidney, but on distant organs. Uh, so for example, a patient developing pulmonary edema will have leaky capillaries not only relate to fluid overload, but also inflammatory mediated injury to the pulmonary vasculature. Also in the heart, in the cardiac tissue, it has been reported that uh, inflammation may occur in AKA patients and patients who have recovered for a from AKA may have uh, cardiovascular, increased cardiovascular mortality. So this activation of inflammation during AKA results by many mechanisms, whatever the initial injury to the kidney was, uh, but distant organs are affected, the lungs are commonly affected, and also other organs are subject to inflammatory injury. So virtually every inflammatory cell has been implicated in pathogenesis of acute kidney injury. Uh, for example, macrophages, resident macrophages, which are found in the kidney, and other uh, cells as well, neutrophils, leukocytes. Uh, every cell has been implicated depending on initial studies were in animal models, human studies are uh, also uh, being performed. Uh, so depending on the study you see, there are many mechanisms of inflammation and inflammatory cells implicated in acute kidney injury. So the same inflammatory cells are responsible for uh, later phase of repair. This has also been uh, shown in uh, many reports. So as you can see in this slide, the initial injury, sepsis, uh, ischemia, reperfusion, toxins, whatever the inciting agent triggers immune response, uh, which results in acute kidney injury. Uh, the other thing, uh, when the injury or the triggers are there, uh, response with resident macrophages, recruited um, parts of immune cells, both innate and adaptive cellular or uh, humoral immunity is activated. And there will be apoptosis, cytokine, and chemokine secretion, mitochondrial injury, which results in damage in the kidney, as well as damage in uh, distant organs like the lung, uh, for example. And primary modifiers of this initial insult include further ischemic insults. For example, if the patient has already a trigger, for example, if the patient has sepsis as a trigger of acute kidney injury, uh, insults like ischemic insult, hemodynamic instability, low renal perfusion, bacteremia, all these things and pre-existing uh, disease put the patient at risk for inflammatory response. And after this inflammatory response is established, further injuries incited by antibiotics, fluids, uh, renal replacement therapy, and uh, many other uh, triggers that will exacerbate the inflammatory response. So it's now known that uh, inflammatory response is triggered in whatever the cause of kidney injury. And it's time dependent. Early in the course of acute kidney injury, if you identify uh, patients at risk, most injuries are preventable. For example, if the patient has old age and pre-existing CKD, uh, you know that this patient is at a market uh, markedly increased risk of AKI, so early prevention of uh, hemodynamic instability, early prevention of ischemia may prevent this inflammatory response. So this is a simplified version of what we've talked about. First, there will be cell damage, cell days, usually in sepsis and ATN, usually the tubular interstitial, uh, uh, it's a tubular uh, process, interstitial nephritis, there is interstitial process, we will not discuss about glomerular pathologies here because that's fast and uh, that's another uh, 
topic for another time. And then this cell damage and days that occurs in the tubules and interstitium results in acute inflammatory response. The same cells then participate in repair and regeneration. So, for example, in patients with drug-induced interstitial nephritis, it's now believed that uh, fibrosis or uh, scarring resu results in the first one week. So this inflammatory insult results in fibrosis in patients with interstitial nephritis starting from the first week. So it's not a simple process of, um, you know, ischemia and reperfusion injury, rather a whole cascade of inflammatory response is activated in the kidney and it's released or uh, circulating cytokines or uh, chemokines may exert effect elsewhere. So uh, there is risk of disrupting this repair process. For example, if somebody has acute kidney injury and we are giving nephrotoxic medications on top of that and we are exacerbating further ischemia uh, by uh, not controlling sepsis or not addressing the underlying issue, we disrupt this repair process and uh, AKI course of AKI may be extended and some patients may take months or several weeks to recover. So uh, the other important thing in, uh, to know as physicians is uh, the definitions of AKI. So different definitions have been proposed over the years. The point of this evolving definitions is catching AKI early. So unfortunately, like I said, serum creatine is the marker and you suspect patients would develop acute kidney injury when their urine output is affected, usually, but it's possible to have non-oliguric AKI. But when their urine output is being affected, especially in critically ill patients who are at risk, there has to be a cutoff to diagnose kidney injury. Uh, so this uh, 0.3 milligram per deciliter absolute creatine uh, increase within 48 hours is currently the accepted um, criteria. As you can see, it was initially proposed by the Akin criteria, uh, and then it was adapted by the KDGO. Uh, as you can see, the KDGO section, also 0.3 milligram per deciliter over 48 hours, is taken as the cutoff. Why did we take this 0.3? Is to catch kidney damage earlier. Uh, why not take 1.5 to 2 from baseline? Still, that's another indication. Uh, the original criteria definition was the rifle criteria, that you can see on the right side. So the risk criteria in rifle is serum creatine in greater than 1.5 uh, times the baseline to increase within seven days. So why we, we are not using the rifle criteria anymore is you don't need to wait seven days to diagnose acute kidney injury because by the time the creatine has increased by 1.5 times its baseline, the J4 damage is believed to be significant. So, seven days cut off might not be uh, great. The other benefit of the Akin criteria, which is also adapted by the KDCO, uh, is that it doesn't need baseline creatinine. You just measure the creatinine and repeat another creatinine within 48 hours. Of course, if the patient's urine output is declining, you have to intervene before this 48 hours time, whatever the serum creatinine was. So if a patient has one milligram per deciliter creatinine at admission and develops 1.3 milligram per deciliter at 48 hours after admission, that, uh, that's by definition acute kidney injury. This 0.3 milligram also shows significant damage uh, when translated into JFR. So the other thing I want you to see in this definition is the staging. So in the rifle criteria, which was the original criteria, they defined risk as uh, greater than 1.5 injury as greater than two times failure, loss, and uh, end-stage kidney disease. In the uh, Akin and KDGO criteria, they have eliminated loss, which is complete loss of kidney function for greater than four weeks, and end-stage kidney disease for greater than three months. So this is not necessary in the management of acute injury, but personally in clinical practice, someone who, who does not have recovery from acute kidney injury in four weeks usually will not recover uh, from their AK. That's the most common trend we see in our day-to-day -day practice. So I don't necessarily agree with removal of this uh, criteria, but they removed it because it has no value uh, prognostically. So this stage in stage one, two, three predicts the value. The other important thing is initiation of uh, renal replacement therapy is uh, used as stage as staging mechanism, stage three, because we know that uh, AKI patients who have been started on hemodialysis have the worst prognosis when we are talking about long-term outcomes. In the short term, they may be okay, 
uh, dialysis uh, complications are there, but still we may do okay in the short term. In the long term, uh, though, dialysis requiring AK is an increased risk factor. So take home message from this is use 0 0.3 milligram deciliter from uh, creatinine uh, increment as a marker of AK, and you may need to no need to memorize everything. You just need to be worried if creatinine is greater than four or if there is uh, initiation of renal replacement therapy. So this is the KDGO. It's a combination of the Akin in the rifle criteria. Uh, they are uh, advocating 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter increase as a diagnostic cutoff for AKI, increased serum creatine above four or three times baseline renal replacement therapy, and in patients in uh, children, uh, decrease in JFR less than 35 is used as a marker of severity. And anurea is also a marker of severity, but sometimes in clinical practice, we see uh, we are called for consultation uh, reporting that the patient is anuric. Uh, in the first place, the patient did not take enough fluid, especially this occurs in ICU, where patients have seemingly interstitial congestion, but intravascular volume is depleted, and there is inertia by most physicians we encounter to resuscitate with fluid and C. Uh, so if genuine anuria occurs, despite adequate resuscitation and adequate management, that's a poor prognostic factor and also included in uh, advanced stage CKD by the KDGO. So unfortunately, the KDGO guidelines were revised in 2012. I'm sure there will be newer uh, advances when it comes to uh, the newer criteria. So I'm going through this because these are important thresholds. So the ICING criteria is a modification of the rifle criteria and AK stage one, uh, the rifle risk, uh, rifle describes risk, just risk if there is increment to 1.5 times two, but now we know that even small risks so in small increases in creatinine translate to relatively uh, severe JFR damage. So instead of risk, we use stage one, stage two and stage three. So we don't use the term failure anymore. Uh, because failure is uh, reserved to stage 5 CKD, which is where there is no irreversibility. Otherwise, in acute skin injury, reversibility is always uh, possible if we give the appropriate support here. So I've already mentioned that smaller change in creatinine is very significant when it comes to actual glomerular filtration rates. Uh, so it also in the rifle criteria, uh, I've mentioned that low and end stage kidney disease are excluded. Many studies have shown that staging in the rifle was independently predictive of mortality, uh, but mortality may actually be related to the underlying severe disease. For example, uh, patient, septic patients will have dialysis requiring AK and very high creatinine. So the mortality may not directly be attributed to the kidney injury itself. Rather, it may be because of severe sepsis and multi-organ failure, right? Uh, but uh, still, these criteria were uh, good in terms of predicting um, future prognosis. So studies try to compare Akin and rifle criteria in ICU patients, no substantial difference when using the two criteria, both, show, uh, both shown to be great in predicting prognosis of critical patients with acute kidney injury. But like I told you, we don't know if the actual creatinine or the underlying disease caused the mortality. In my clinical experience, usually it's the underlying cause, addressing the underlying cause. Also, we see we face a lot of problems with thinking that dialysis and focusing on the kidney will uh, actually change the course of sepsis, right? So, uh, but that's not usually uh, correct. Sepsis should be aggressively managed in acute kidney injury or in whatever ICU scenario, interstitial nephrites, whatever is the inciting cause or the underlying cause of the CKD, or the, of the AKI, sorry, should be managed aggressively. So I don't think the creatinine is the cause of mortality in such patients, rather the severity of the underlying disease, which is reflected by severe acute kidney injury. So just to see a few points on prognosis. So uh, the notion that AKI will occur in a patient in a critically ill patient or otherwise admitted patient and outpatient and recovers totally is uh, not acceptable because we know that AKI is an independent predictor of future CKD. Uh, 
progressive CKD in, in stage renal disease. So the potential mechanisms. So we're not talking about glomerulonephritis here, but if there is glomerular pathology, glomerular sclerosis, we result in we result from the initial pathology, tubulous interstitial fibrosis. I told you we result early, uh, especially in severe uh, CKD, interstitial in, inflammation, and progressive nephro loss may occur in acute kidney injury. So in clinical practice, uh, we tend to follow AKI patients, especially dialysis requiring AKI should be followed lifelong because once a patient has severe AKI, the scar will be there, right? Think of it as tissue damage everywhere else or in other parts of our body. There will be some inflammation going on, scarring process starts, so there is some scar in the kidney. So there is no way that the kidney will recover fully, especially if it was stage three uh, AKI or AKI requiring dialysis uh, therapy. So we follow them lifelong and we have to follow lifelong because future CKD is unacceptably high in such populations. Cardiovascular events may be related to inflammation. So uh, scientists tend, tend to say oxidative stress when there is no other um, known mechanism, but okay, let's accept oxidative stress as well. So this inflammation I've talked about earlier will result in cardiovascular events and large studies have shown increased cardiovascular mortality in patients who are just recovering from acute kidney injury. The other event may be elevated blood pressure that occurs with uh, damage, maybe a potential mechanism, impaired sodium handling may result. Uh, so we'll discuss more about fluid and fluid retention in acute kidney injury later. So recurrent AKI, so there will be uh, significant physiologic derangements when we are talking about tubular interstitial damage, especially the interstitial if it is damaged, that's where urine is concentrated. And uh, so urine concentrating defects may persist in some patients with AKI. So the notion that AKI is totally fully reversible is wrong. And we should ask suspicions for uh, future uh, risks. So in mild forms of AKI, this may not be the case, but if the AKI was severe, uh, so I suggest we follow them for a long period of time, uh, if preferable. So. Let's proceed to approach uh, to patients with acute kidney injury. So anything I want uh, you want me to clarify, please try to write it like you went A. Uh, so try to avoid redundant questions that we'll have time to answer most of them. So I'd be happy to explain if anything is not clear in my uh, presentation. So when we are approaching the patients, so serum creatinine remains the major biomarker for diagnosis of AK. So if we suspect AK, we diagnose based on serum creatinine, based on the definition and the criteria that we have been discussed about. They all have their gaps, uh, but still, uh, that's what we have so far, so we have to uh, stick to those. So using serum creatinine as a biomarker is far from ideal, but uh, so people all over the world are looking for the ideal biomarker, but when we are interpreting serum creatinine patients with acute kidney injury, for our day-to-day -day practice, we have to know that serum creatinine is not the ideal marker. And there may be some, uh, uh, some you know, like uh, abnormalities which may not directly translate to GFR. So we have to be cautious when interpreting uh, serum creatinine. So the first thing I want to emphasize on is serum creatinine changes occur much later than the actual occurrence of kidney dysfunction. So unfortunately, we don't have a marker that will detect the injury before serum creatinine. So usually a few days have passed when serum creatinine increases uh, to see that uh, the kidney injury has occurred. So that's one gap. The other thing is uh, also same thing. JFR may be affected by greater than 50% before serum creatinine changes significantly before it's 1.5 or two times uh, the normal. So creatinine may be uh, markedly affected by non-renal factors in acute illness. Uh, so we'll discuss more on that later. So the ideal biomarker for acute kidney injury, ideally should detect kidney injury timely. Right? So kidney injury versus kidney function. With creatinine, we are assessing kidney function, not the actual injury. So if there was any inflammatory marker or marker of kidney injury, that uh, will help us detect AKI before the kidney function or the creatinine is impaired, uh, that would be great, but we, studies have been are going on, we don't have a concrete or validated marker to date. So this uh, measurement, the biomarker, should be as close to actual JFR as possible. Uh, we should be able to detect small changes in JFR uh, 
with this marker. So nerve renal determinants of creatinine, especially in the admitted patients, you have to consider muscle mass, right? For example, um, patients who are emaciated will not uh, have very high creatinines despite significant injury. So for example, a well-nourished patient may develop AKI and have creatinine of three, and a very emaciated patient may have creatinine of 1.5, and the JFR damage might be equal. So muscle mass is important. We know that creatinine comes from muscle. So anybody who's emaciated and has loss of muscle mass, uh, we should be careful in interpreting AK. So when that emaciated person's creatinine reaches four, that patient may have lost all of the JFR. So be, please be careful in patients uh, who have loss of muscle mass. The other thing is protein intake. People on high protein diets, uh, especially in the wards, this happens frequently. Patients take high protein diet and measure the creatine the next day, and creatine will be elevated. Uh, so that's another uh, thing. The other is fluid status. Fluid status, your results, your uh, from, uh, uh, affix creatine from volume of distribution drugs. I'm not that much worried about uh, CMT in say to uh, compete with excretion of creatine, but that, that's only a small percentage. So at just 14 to 15 percent, if the patient is obesity, that's not a major worry. It does not affect that much. Age, as age increases, we know that JFR declines. So consider that uh, gender also, uh, I mean, sex is related to muscle mass. Uh, women have uh, lower muscle mass than men. So also try to see that acute illness generally disrupts uh, our renal function test measurement. So we have to be careful when we are interpreting creatine. So new biomarkers have been investigated uh, to replace serum creatinine. Cystatin C has been used in CKD equations, uh, but not clearly clinically validated in acute injury. In Gallic, kidney are the most promising so far. Uh, they are still in the early phases. Uh, so kidney injury molecule, especially KIM-1, is uh, promising, and it's able to detect kidney injury before there is any change in renal function tests, current renal function tests, but still these are not clinically uh, validated. So all these uh, markers have been tried. So JFR estimation formulas better to be avoided in uh, AKI because JFR cannot be used in the setting of AKI. Creatinine is not usually stable. So calculating JFR will just mislead you so try to follow for uh, this maybe i mean uh, uh, significant in patients who developed acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease so what we call ak on ckd mostly uh, traditionally so these patients who have a baseline creatinine you know their baseline jfr and then they develop ak so you have to be careful not to calculate uh, jfr at this point because the acute cells needs to stabilize first and you need to have serial measurements uh, of serum creatinine before uh, considering calculations for JFR. So we'll talk about adjusting drugs later on. Uh, so let's proceed to etiologic diagnosis. Uh, so we have to know the etiology of acute skin injury, otherwise by itself the syndrome can occur, but uh, we will not be intervened. Like I told you, treatment of the underlying cause is more important uh, than uh, anything else. So as soon as you diagnose based on the above definitions and creating in all the things we discussed about and considering the patient's clinical condition, you assess a AKI and then immediately we have to pro uh, proceed to etiologicals. So what I suggest, what I practice myself is to focus on reversible cause. For example, pre-renal insult is the first thing I would consider. Uh, we'll talk about fluid assessment, but at least I will try to give a trial of fluid in most patients, unless they are uh, clearly congested and have pulmonary edema, chest crackles, and overall uh, other congestions I'm not worried about, like peripheral edema and uh, other fascial edema I'm not concerned about. Rather, if the chest is clear in any patient seemingly congested or not, if chest is okay and there is no pulmonary edema, it's better to try with fluid. So that's my strategy. First, you exclude pre-renal causes. So what this beneficial is, before further testing, before exposing the patient to uh, other tests, before uh, doing uh, further treatment, you can just try with fluid and exclude pre-renal. Okay. So after six hours of adequate hydration, after 24 hours of adequate hydration, you can easily exclude pre-renal insults. Especially when you are doing etiologic diagnosis, give the patient fluid if there is no pulmonary edema and see the response. Pre-renal insults will be uh, clearly 
uh, excluded. And then I would do ultrasound because after taking his train, giving the patient fluid immediately, if ultrasound is available, it's very difficult if it's not readily available, that ultrasound uh, examination will exclude obstruction for you because significant obstruction, hydronephrosis will be clearly evident in ultrasound. It's non-invasive and there is, uh, Unless you want to take out a kidney stone, you don't need to do further imaging like CT or other invasive imaging. So ultrasound is enough to block obstruction. So exclude pre-renal and post-renal causes if they worry about workup the intrinsic causes, because there's nothing much you can do if there is intrinsic damage to the kidney. So traditionally, pre-renal, intrinsic, post-renal, we, we stick to this uh, in general because this is very important. Pre-renal and post-renal are easily reversible. So intrinsic AK, we just wait for the kidney to recover while treating the underlying cause. So pre-renal uh, azotemia results from compromised renal pl plasma flow. This is just a reminder. I'm sure most of you know this, but I just want to go through uh, the causes quickly. So, Compromised renal blood flow resulting from hypovolemia, obvious GI loss, hemorrhage, burn, pancreatitis, third spacing, and cardiac output reduction, heart failure, and shock, uh, uh, drugs, non steroidals, ACE inhibitors, and ARVs. So these are the major things that will cause uh, pre renal insults. So uh, discontinuing such drugs, uh, diuresing patients with heart failure, and managing the shock and managing. Uh, fluid resuscitation uh, in case of hypovolemia may be life saving. Pre renal azotemia is not a structural damage, it's easily reversible, and there may, may be times it may be difficult to differentiate. Patients may be seemingly euvolemic, but it's good to give a trial of it anyway. Urine electrolytes would have been great because the kidney reserves uh, sodium and urine sodium will be extremely low in patients with renal azotemia, unless the cause is diuretics, of course. So urine sodium would be great, but we don't have urine sodium, uh, sodium here in the country, so you have to rely on your uh, clinical judgment and patient food responsiveness. So everybody does not develop renal azotemia. Patients who have clear GI loss, nausea, vomiting, clearly dehydrated, uh, do not develop prerenal insult. So who are at risk? Mostly older age individuals where renal autoregulation is impaired. Underlying CKD, I would say, is the most important risk factor for renal insult. People with CKD, uh, before assuming that the CKD has progressed, it's good to know if they had any loss or if they had any renal insult, heart failure, uh, things like that should be excluded. This is what I face on a day-to-day -day basis. Patients with underlying CKD creatine of 2-3 come with creatine of 6-7. And uh, there's, we tend to rush to assume that this CKD has progressed, but we, most of them, we try to look for pre-renal causes and give them a little fluid, see if their heart is okay, and they recover most of them and go back to their baseline. So again, CKD is a most uh, common risk factor, atherosclerosis, systemic hypertension, drugs, all this tamper with uh, renal autoregulation and put the patient at risk for pre-renal azotemia. So healthy young individuals usually do not develop pre-renal insult usually, unless the loss is massive. So intrinsic AKI, uh, sepsis, arguably the most common cause of uh, intrinsic AKI. So no need to talk about sepsis. Mechanism is uh, vaso renal vasodilation as it occurs with the rest of the uh, circulation in other parts of the body. So there is a misconception that sepsis need to cause septic shock to cause AKI. That's not the case. Patients with sepsis who fulfill uh, different criteria for sepsis and have normal blood pressure can still develop sep septic AKN. So especially the ones uh, who are at risk, these patients, older age, CKD, atherosclerosis, hypertension, uh, these patients can develop uh, sepsis even if they have high blood pressure. So shock is not necessary for septic AKN. Renal uh, vasodilation still occurs in normal uh, state. Ischemia is an extension of pre-renal insult. So yeah, so all the things we talked about earlier, uh, if they're not addressed, sometimes even if they are addressed in patients who are at very high risk, uh, ischemia may occur. And nephrotoxins, of course, virtually any drug can cause uh, nephrotoxic injury, drug-induced interstitial nephrites. The common drug I see in clinical practice is safe traxone. We assume that cephalosporins are safe for the kidney, but 
I mean, we cannot, uh, in most of our settings, safe transfer is the first available drug, is very available to treat infections. But as a habit, we should uh, monitor renal function tests. So I have seen many patients developing dialysis requiring interstitial nephritis because of safe drugs on administration. Uh, so any antibiotic is a risk factor. More we see with cephalosporins and sulfonylureas. Uh, rifampicin is rare, actually. I've never seen a case of rifampicin uh, induced interstitial nephrites, but it's reported. Uh, vancomycin mechanisms are not clear, but it's also nephrotoxic. So be careful about antibiotics. No drug is safe and try to monitor, except drugs that have, uh, which are clearly uh, eliminated by the kidney, such as parastamol and opioids. Other drugs have the potential to cause kidney injuries. Even common antibiotics, we have to be careful about the monitor, especially in patients who are at risk for acute kidney injury. Uh, clinical evaluation, these are obvious things, food loss, infection, admission, medication history in the past one year is very important in patients uh, because, believe it or not, in steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, if the patient was on continuous dose of non-inflammatory drugs uh, in the past year, the AKA may come later on in this aspect even body swelling, hypertension, hematuria uh, occur. Hematuria is usually more specific for glomerular disease, but hypertension and body swelling occur as a result of fluid retention. So I will not go into details of history and physical examination, but it's very important. Clinically, after history, it kind of gives you the sense where the AKI came from most of the time. So ultrasound, we discussed non-invasive tool as urgent as possible. It's, it should be done. Also, this excludes chronic kidney disease, it measures the kidney size, uh, cortical thinning in case of obstruction, and also uh, mainly the size. And what we use uh, ultrasound for in acute kidney injuries to rule out obstruction most of the time because the NCK. So if it's a chronic process, still it does not mean that you shouldn't treat for acute kidney injury, depending on the clinical condition that patient came in. If they are admitted, if they have the above history that we mentioned, even if the kidney is shrunken, you should still exclude prenal, postrenal in intrinsic causes. So we have to preserve whatever residual function the, the kidney is having in the patient. So mainly obstructive uropathy and CKD is seen. In acute, this is dilated as an example, dilated pelvic calcium system in hydronephrosis. As you can see, it's very easy to pick, and you can further work up for obstruction, but immediately while relieving the obstruction, you would see changes in serum creatinine in a patient clinical scenario. And uh, you, you should not delay relieving obstruction by more than two weeks because after two weeks of obstruction, the kidney will. Uh, have irreversible damage and it's very difficult to come back to the normal state. So intervene within 48 hours or if it's possible, uh, if it's not possible, within one week maximum obstruction should be relieved. So the other thing, uh, so I always tell uh, my students and uh, the fellows that if you have a good history and urinalysis, you can diagnose and a good microscope, you can diagnose virtually any kidney disease. Uh, so this, uh, the first one, uh, as you can see, is uh, these are crystals. The, in B, you can see uric acid crystals, and uh, these are WC casts, you can see. So WC casts are not common. We see them in patients with interstitial nephritis, whether it's pyelonephritis or drug-induced interstitial nephritis. Uh, uric acid uh, casts are not common also, but we may see that. So the other thing we should look for in the urinalysis is better if uh, physicians see urines and it gives you a clear uh, direction. So we'll talk more about etiology uh, while we are talking about urinalysis as well. So these are renal tubular epithelia, as you can see, as uh, round in round cells uh, in A, uh, they have clear nucleus. So these are mar markers of tubular injury. So there will be shading of renal tubular epithelium into the tubules when there is ATA. When there is ischemic injury, uh, there will be shading of these cells. And on B, you can see renal tubular epithelial cast. These are not common to see, but the cells, we see them all the time in patients with uh, injury, ATN, ischemic injury to the kidney. So continuous shading of uh, tubular cells is there. So these are classic granular or medibrown casts, also classic uh, ATN. Uh, 
So if you see this, uh, usually the uh, urine field will be filled with this uh, muddy brown casts and diagnosis of ATN can be made. Uh, so this is a hyaline cast. This occurs in prerenal acute kidney injury. If you don't see anything and just see hyaline casts, uh, this may be uh, a prerenal insult or it can occur also in the general. So the other thing is dysmorphic RBCs. As you can see in some of the lives, uh, the cells, there is bedding from the RBC. Uh, these are uh, some uh, dysmorphic RBCs. These are very specific for glomerular disease. So if you see cells like, especially the lower cells, as you can see with bedding, multiple bedding, and also there is another cell with one bedding, the classic uh, features of dysmorphic RBC. These are typical for uh, glomerular disease and they don't occur in other scenarios. There has to be a glomerular pathology. So wh what we do when we see dysmorphic RBCs is do a kidney biopsy uh, because definitely the pathology is uh, glomerular. So RBC cast is also uh, very specific for glomerular disease. Sometimes 10% uh, of the cases you may see RBC cast in patients with interstitial nephritis. Uh, so the other modality when all uh, have been investigated and uh, and there is no ATN, clear ATN, no prerenal insult, no obstruction, when you have excluded drugs and you believe that uh, there is no cause for the acute kidney injury, unexplained acute kidney injury or rapidly progressive kidney disease, sometimes uh, you may need to do biopsy. So of this unexplained acute kidney injury, 10% of the biopsies turn out to be interstitial nephrites. Most biopsies turn out to be interstitial nephrites. And the other is, of course, nephrotic syndrome. Above age 18, everybody should have biopsy. Acute nephritic syndrome, you should have biopsy to diagnose. There are scenarios where we may not do biopsy, but I will not go into those uh, glomerular disease as it's beyond the scope. So unexplained AK, if after everything, after urinalysis and excluding all other causes, if still the creatinine is increasing and you don't have a cause, kidney biopsy should be done. So uh, I will talk about prevention and management of acute kidney injury. So the first thing is identifying high risk patients. So we have discussed earlier, but to add more, ICU patients are at increased risk of uh, acute kidney injury. Some series suggest that 80% of ICU patients, as uh, high as 80%, may have AKI. So uh, we have to be careful early consultations, early fluid management, and early interventions may result in AKI recovery. And avoiding fluid overload is also significant. ARD patients, uh, mostly, or, of course, are also ICU, are at an increased risk. Also, operative patients, acute decompensated heart failure, there will be significant renal insight. Some may even develop chronic kidney disease old age comorbidities, CKD, cirrhosis, all these things are risk factors. Identify these risk factors in any patient is admitted. So when you assess the risk, there are preventive uh, modalities. So the next step after identifying high risk patients and trying to prevent is to uh, uh, fluid management and fluid assessment. So both hypovolemia and hypervolemia are associated with poor outcomes. Uh, so this has been shown in many studies. So hypovolemia for obvious reasons and hypervolemia independently so it increases uh, mortality. So assessment of fluid may be very challenging, especially in critically ill AKI patients. So these are some parameters. The first one is clinical parameters like body weight changes. If somebody has gained weight, usually that's how we assess uh, fluid overload in our ward patients. You can measure the weight and if the fluid intake is not balanced by the fluid removal by the kidney, of course, fluid accumulation will result in body weight changes, input, output, balance. Uh, these uh, uh, are very important. Blood pressure, so I would say blood pressure is an excellent marker of fluid status. Blood pressure will be on the low side, patients may not be in shock, but on the low side, patients who are not uh, who are dehydrated, because in AKI, we expect that fluid and sodium retention, so blood pressure to be on the higher side. Right? If the blood pressure on the lower side, always good to suspect fluid deficit. Uh, urine volume is important, pulmonary edema uh, is very important. Always auscultate the chest in patients with acute Urinary indices would be great to do urine sodium, like I said, in seemingly volumic patients, but that's not our scenario, unfortunately. Hematology changes, others 
uh, are also there. So there is no one or uh, there is no head to head comparison. Some studies have compared clinical to ultrasound uh, measurement uh, showing clinical might be better. Others have said ultrasound might be better, but uh, from experience, a combination of measures is uh, good. For example, if the patient's gaining weight, high blood pressure, uh, chest crackers, and also you see uh, high uh, IVC diameter, you may suggest this patient is fluid overloaded on the reverse if IVC is uh, collapsing, blood pressure is on the low side, patient has signs of dehydration peripherally, you would say. So I would advise to combine clinical and uh, imaging parameters. So central venous pressure, if there are central lines, it's very easy to measure uh, with simple ruler uh, and IVC. So, but uh, if there is no central lines, at least IVC diameter, but clinical parameters might be enough if these are not available. So I have put the references here. Uh, it's very interesting to read on fluid assessment. Uh, dynamic measures are also there. Stroke volume recent studies uh, have uh, said that stroke volume measurements may correlate better with fluid status uh, in AKI patients, but that's just one study, single centered. Um, so they have been evaluated. There is no hard uh, recommendation to say use this method. So it's better to use a combination of methods and overall because fluid management is the cornerstone of AKI management. So fluid deficit state resuscitation. So Goal director therapy, as with the surviving sepsis guidelines, 30 ml per kg initial bolus might be given. Be careful that there is no chest crackles or pulmonary edema. Uh, so this dose is not in like universal in uh, kidney guidelines. The KDGO guideline, for example, does not specify dose. It just says give some fluid access for fluid uh, responsiveness. So fluid therapy should be targeted. For example. If dehydration is your target, you have to give fluid until your dehydration is has improved. Uh, if uh, there is clear fluid deficit, uh, replacing that clear fluid deficit should be the target. So you cannot keep giving fluid, but also uh, we have to uh, not deny fluid. So usually this is a very difficult clinical scenario, even for experienced nephrologists, because you have to individualize fluid therapy and there is no one uh, method that 30 ml per kg in septic patients might be okay, um, but assess fluid responsiveness. There is no clear cut dose written in renal guidelines. So fluid balance and rates of fluid removal are very important. If somebody is anuric, we cannot give pumping fluid. We just try with small amount of fluid. If the patient remains anuric, there is no reason to give pyrazal fluid. If the patient remains oliguric, there is no reason to give Further fluid diuretics have no value in initial resuscitation unless the patient has pulmonary edema. Okay, so also to assess which patients are responsive to fluid, there is no clear parameter. Even the KDGO does not put clear parameters. It just says that target based on your patient and C for responsiveness clinical. So this needs experience, but it's good uh, to see each and every patient individually. So fluid resuscitation is more effective as a preventive strategy. Uh, some, some studies have shown liberal use of fluids may harm and increase mortality in established AKI, but still this not, should not prohibit us from giving fluid in patients, uh, but you have to assess fluid removal rate as well, not just pumping fluid. So, and renal outcomes and mortality benefits of fluid therapy are not established. Giving fluid may not have direct benefits. Some scenarios it may have, like as in contract. Okay. Otherwise, there is no outcome or renal outcome or clear mortality benefit uh, with resuscitation. So our target is targeted or goal-directed resuscitation to, uh, you know, improve dehydration status and prevent kidney damage. As a preventive strategy, it's excellent. But once a case is established, uh, we have to individualize treatment. So this has been a debate. Uh, so before 2016, there were a lot of debates, but Newer studies suggest that critical alloys are preferred. Colloids, synthetic colloids like albumin and other uh, have no survival benefit. Some studies show they may cause harm and they, may, they remain in the IV space, in the, in the intravascular space. But critical alloys are distributed uh, across uh, different food, uh, compartments and have better uh, resuscitation abilities uh, and tissue 
uh, research station abilities than uh, COVID. So the guidelines also suggest crystalloids are preferred, not isotonic uh, isotonic crystalloids, hypotonic foods should be avoided also. So I will not go into detail of all the evidence, but if you are interested to read, there are different studies uh, that gives you insight into food management and uh, pathophysiology of food balance in, in acute kidney injury. So uh, replacing the fluid, uh, like I said, should be individualized, is as important uh, as management. Of, management of fluid overload is as important as fluid resuscitation. Fluid overload is independently associated with mortality. So I have cited some articles for you to refer later on. And judicious fluid therapy is in, indicated in patients who are initially to respond to fluid administration. In fluid responders, there's no reason to give or pump fluid. For example, in ICUs and in critically ill patients, uh, we find patients in uh, four liter, five liter fluid excess because the physicians believe that this patient is in shock and needs more fluid. Uh, but that should not be the scenario. If they are not initially responsive, there's no need to. But if they are initially responsive, you have to be liberal with fluid as long as you don't induce congestion. So excessive fluid is very difficult to get rid of. Uh, people will be in very high fluid excess state. It may take days, weeks, and, uh, and it also increases the likelihood of putting the patient on renal replacement therapy because there is no way to uh, remove the fluid quickly because the kidney recovery takes time. It may take two weeks for ATN to recover, so you cannot take with two weeks with this uh, renal uh, with this fluid overload, and it will force us to uh, initiate renal replacement. So, what causes fluid overload in AKI? Excessive use of IV fluids in non-responders. If they are responding, it's okay. If they have adequate urine output, you can keep giving fluid. activation of the renal angiotensin in the aldosterone system. Of course, when there is low perfusion to the Kidneys, also sympathetic activation, vasopressin release from non osmotic stimuli like nausea, pain, and other things that may occur in adult patients. Hypoalbuminemia uh, also results in fluid retention. So, use of diuretics, of course, for uh, I would just recommend when not to use diuretics. Of course, most of you know how to manage pulmonary edema and uh, fluid overload. So we have to uh, give diuretics, keep increasing the dose until there is adequate response. So diuretics should not be used to prevent AK, rather only to treat uh, fluid overload, volume overload. Multiple studies have shown that fluoroacemide is harmful, causes uh, AK when given to prevent AK, uh, but it's excellent when uh, we are using to treat fluid overload. The other thing, it may increase mortality in critically ill patients, uh, not strong evidence with this, but there are studies, and it's one of the drugs known to cause interstitial nephritis. So, but in patients with fluid overload, give diuretics, maximize the dose. Uh, Tiazides may not be that effective in acute kidney injury, so you have to rely on maximum use of maximum dose of fluid diuretics if that does not work. If it's refractory, we proceed to dialysis. So, uh, recent review only showed few interventions to have benefits uh, when we are talking about fluid and other and diuretics. So I, I have put the uh, uh, reference here, so you can refer that IV fluids contrasting with AKI. They are excellent in prevention of AKI. They should be administered before and after uh, contrast with AKI, uh, contrast uh, administration. Diuretics for acute decompensated heart failure and cardiorenal syndrome will result in uh, increased renal perfusion and are shown to uh, prevent or treat pre-renal insult in acute kidney injury combination therapy, Albumin, ectriotide, and nidrodine have been effective in hepatorenal syndrome. Otherwise, you manage based on the fluid status of the patient. So, management of complications, I will not take time, uh, just mention some of the complications, and um, uh, there is nothing new regarding management of pulmonary edema. You have to keep escalating the dose until you get good urine output. If not, proceed to dialysis. Hyperkalemia management is mandatory, especially if there are ECG changes. Hyper and hyponatremia should be managed as well. Uh, hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia, not a, an urgent worry in uh, AK unless they are symptomatic and there is severe changes. Acid based disorders, acidosis should be managed uh, with dialysis. Uh, so most of us don't have, uh, some private centers have arterial blood gas analyzers in some uh, public ICUs, but it's very difficult and frustrating. Uh, 
the fact that we are unable to diagnose metabolic acidosis in acute kidney injury. But we guess sometimes with breathing patterns and other possibilities. And if available drugs, drugs and dialysis should be there. Uremia should be treated with dialysis. Malnutrition, there are recommendations uh, in the guidelines for calorie intake in acute kidney injury infection resulting from dialysis catheters, also the uremic state and cardiovascular complications, which we cannot do anything about really. So management of complications is another major principle. Uh, so prevention of further renal damage is uh, drug adjustment. I would like to say a few points about this. Uh, one is serum creatinine does not accurately measure JFR. So we have to assume that the JFR is very low in AKI. Volume distribution of drugs is affected, especially common antibiotics. Uh, this may result in uh, underdosing viral. So volume of distribution is increased in acute kidney injury. So underdosing of the effective uh, dose may not reach the target. So we have to be careful. General recommendations, those should be adjusted once creatinine is above two. In emaciated patients, you may consider adjusting creatinine is above 1.5. Uh, assume JFR is less than 15 in patients with AK, so you are just as if they are in end-stage renal disease. So the side effects of our, uh, adjusting as if they are in stage is you may undergo serious infections like meningitis and like so. Sometimes it's better to discuss and you may give higher doses required if you have to uh, address meningitis or other life-threatening infection points. Consider drug level monitoring, which is a dream. In our, so we, are, we have the technology, but we don't have the trend of doing uh, drug level monitoring. So higher loading doses may be considered because of issue of volume of distribution I have discussed about, but reduced or unchanged or no maintenance dose depending on the drug. So frequent dose adjustments may be mandatory if the patient is recovering or creatinine is increasing. Uh, okay, so let's come to the final uh, I'll be discussing about, I know I took time, but uh, there are main issues to discuss here. So initiating renal replacement therapy, we all know that it indications refractory fluid overload, refractory hyperkalemia, acidosis, uremic symptoms. So they have compared early initiation with delayed initiation, potentially early initiation has better control of fluid and electrolyte balance and may prevent occurring of complications, life-threatening complications like hyperkalemia. Uh, but delayed initiation, has also its benefits. Uh, so early and delayed, uh, early is defined as when, as soon as there is stage three AK, as soon as there is creatinine is elevated above four, or uh, if creatinine is increased three times from baseline. Delayed initiation is defined as uh, waiting for complications to occur. So delayed initiation has also as benefits that allows patient stabilization before initiation of uh, renal replacement therapy may prevent complications related to dialysis, like hypotension, catheter infection, and the like. Uh, so there are many studies. Uh, I will go uh, fast uh, for the sake of time. So the first one is the Akiki study, which was a multi-center randomized control trial, showing that uh, critically ill patients with severe acute kidney injury, there was no difference with regard to mortality between early and delayed strategy. So delayed strategy, uh, prevented the need for renal replacement therapy in significant number of patients. So there is, they showed that before this study was published in 2016, there was great controversy whether to start uh, before to prevent symptoms or to start when traditional indications arise. But after this study, we know that mortality, there is no difference and delayed initiation will prevent unnecessary dialysis. So it's better to wait for traditional complications. The other is the uh, Elaine uh, trial, so I uh, jump to the conclusion here also, it compared mortality over 90 days. Uh, so delayed initiation reduced mortality over the first 90 days. The problem is a single center study. I think it's French. So still it showed that mortality was decreased with delayed initiation of renal replacement therapy. So wait for traditional indications for dialysis. So the more recent one is start AKI. So to briefly go through this, Start AK is a multinational randomized uh, trial, and uh, it's a Canadian study. They compared initiation uh, within the first 12 hours or when conventional risk factors arise, or if kidney injury persisted for 78 hours, and the primary outcome was uh, any cause at 90 days, and 
uh, accelerated renal uh, replacement therapy was not associated with lower risk of this at 90 days than standard strategy. So most of these studies support, also there are studies that support early initiation, but most evidence guides towards initiation of uh, dialysis only when indications are raised. So mode of renal replacement therapy, CRR, it is the preferred one, it's a luxury in our setting, uh, but ideally it will uh, help patients to have uh, hemodynamic stability, especially patients who are hemodynamically unstable, shock or vasopressors, usually you hear us denying uh, dialysis for patients with severe shock with multi-organ failure and vasopressors because we feel that intermittent hemodialysis like the ones we are giving may uh, destabilize the hemodynamic state further uh, in patients with increased risk of ICP, including uh, traumatic brain injuries because of for CRRT, we don't have it, so it's uh, just for uh, knowledge. So sustained low efficiency dialysis or SLED, what we do is we extend the time and uh, decrease the blood flow of dialysis and this will result in more efficient, uh, low efficiency dialysis intentionally to maintain the hemodynamic stability. Uh, so this is effective and uh, studies comparing SLED to CRRT have shown no significant uh, difference. Uh, so this is a multi-center study of 17 hospitals, ICU patients with acute kidney injury or forms of renal replacement therapy is chemical, um, uh, I mean, intermittent hemodialysis, CRRT, PD, and SLED are acceptable treatment options. So what we can do here is prevent complications on intermittent dialysis. So variable in sodium and ultrafiltration rates remove 50% of the fluid in the first one third of the session and then remove the remaining fluid later if it generates it, reducing dialysis temperature, avoiding meals, controlling sepsis. These things will help us to minimize, but intermittent HD has also been shown to be in patients critical. So dose of dialysis should be individualized. Each dialysis dose should be prescribed by the most experienced physician when it comes to dialysis and preferably in a first. Mortality uh, benefit of different doses is not determined yet. You have to consider patients' flu status, continuous assessment of flu status by the methods we have discussed before, uh, continuous assessment of recovery and continuous assessment of underlying condition should be considered and electrolyte status should be monitored daily. Active dialysis should not be uh, uh, run by uh, nurses like chronic dialysis or it should not be a routine activity. It has to be an uh, aggressive and proactive process where nephrologists and senior physicians are involved in day-to-day -day dialysis stations or every other day dialysis stations until the patient's kidney recovers. So one more thing I would like to touch on is when to discontinue. We see a lot of patients put on dialysis, continuing dialysis in level of kidney disease permanently. So when there is adequate urine amount, initially oliguric or anuric patients, if urine amount is greater than 400 ml, uh, it should, you should consider uh, discontinuing. Sometimes you may try decreasing the frequency of dialysis and in other settings, they may switch one from from CRRT to intermittent and the like. But for our setting, at least you can decrease the frequency of dialysis if it's greater than 400 and wait for the kidney to recover, uh, allow for the kidney to get more fluid instead of removing it by dialysis. Uh, so if your renal is greater than 1,000, success successful discontinuation is uh, much higher. Uh, so your renal should be greater than 2,000 if patient is on diuretics for whatever purposes. So con Continuous dialysis may not be recommended. You should give time for the kidney to recover if the patient is opening up. Uh, resol resolving creatinine is also another indication to continue to discontinue. Make sure the creatinine is done on off dialysis days because immediately after dialysis, creatinine is removed by the machine and may not be beneficial. And resolution of the initial indication. For example, if you initiated for hyperkalemia and that patient is okay, doing fine, that also gives you another indication to discontinue. Thank you so much for your attention. I know I have taken a lot of time, but there's a lot of topics to cover here. The first question, can we diagnose AKI when both results are in the normal range, increase in serum creatinine in 0.5 to 0.9 in 48 hours? Yes, definitely. Uh, so the, for example, in pregnant women, if there is an increase from 0.5 to 0.9, uh, both are seemingly in the normal range, but this pregnant woman is expected to have lower uh, creatinine because of uh, obvious pathologies. So we can definitely diagnose acute kidney injury.
if there is increment, uh, but uh, these are not common scenarios. In some scenarios, we may consider uh, at least these patients are at increased risk. In pregnant women, you can consider. Uh, otherwise, you should consider risk if the creatinine is increasing, but it has to be abnormal. So contrast agents for CT scan in case of AKI. Uh, so use of agents depends on the patient scenario. There is no straightforward uh, reason. But if the CT scan is life-saving, for example, if you want to include or exclude pulmonary thromboembolism, if the uh, diagnosis is mandatory for the life of the patient, it's uh, we can go ahead with contrast. Generally, the new recommendations are regarding CKD patients. In CKD patients, more patients were being denied of relevant uh, imaging, for example, Im relevant contrast for angiography, for example, if a patient has acute coronary syndrome, you should not deny contrast because that patient has AK or CKD or regardless, because angiography is life-saving for the patient. So the newer studies are uh, uh, contrast agents can be used in CKD. You have to uh, individualize patients. You have to hydrate patients before if it allows it. But in AK, we usually do not advocate, but if the imaging is life-saving, go ahead and give contrast. How do you manage patients uh, with AKN extensive edema, hypotension, hypokalemia? So resuscitation, if there is, uh, if you believe that the edema is not intravascular. Usually leg edema, I'm not concerned about because it's usually an interstitial process. As long as the chest is clear, you can uh, hydrate. With fluid, uh, patients with pulmonary edema and in a hypotension, it's very difficult. I don't have a straight answer for you in that regard. But if just other interstitial edema, we are not concerned about. Severity sign of AK, we have discussed creating level up before indications for hemodialysis. Dialysis requiring AK is the most important severity sign, I would say. What will uh, we take baseline creatinine? Because most patients have creatinine before admission and or came with already raised creatinine, question by Nagatu. Thank you, this is a good question. We also have difficulty with baseline creatinines. That's why I prefer using the Akin criteria of raise of 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter over 48 hours. But anybody who comes with elevated creatinine, unless there is ultrasound of shrunken kidneys and obvious, obvious signs of chronicity, it's better to consider as acute kidney injury and do all the steps of resuscitation ultrasound, all the steps we have talked about, but most of our patients do not have baseline, you are right. So baseline creatinine is not required in the Akin criteria or in the KDGO criteria. You can't just take urine output and uh, marginal creatinine. Uh, okay, so uh, Dajani, what kills patients with AK and how to prevent? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the underlying cause usually kills the patient. Usually if it's the cause of AK is sepsis, the sepsis kills the patient most of the time. The kidney itself, uh, I don't know in settings where dialysis is not available, uremia might kill the patient. If dialysis is available, usually the underlying cause kills the patient. No clear mechanism how AKA causes enhanced preserve response. It's just observational studies. How often should we follow serum creatinine? Every other day is great if available. Uh, daily creatinine measurements can be done, but uh, in our setting, every other day creatinine in established AK, in patients at risk of AK, heart failure, CKD, uh, dehydrated patients. Creatinine clearance does not help us in, uh, to diagnose acute kidney injury. A question by Melcom, how does creatinine clearance help to diagnose AK? It does not help. It's not useful, just follow creatinine serially. How does fluid resuscitation uh, rule out perianal azotemia? Tammena, uh, that's a great question. Creatinine will improve with fluid resuscitation if it's perianal azotemia, especially within the 48 hours. If patient has obvious fluid loss, if the perianal azotemia is because of heart failure or CLD, diuretics are the way to go. But if the perianal azotemia is because of loss, when you resuscitate fluid, the creatinine normalizes within 24 hours. That's how it is. Volume type and rates uh, type should be crystalloid, normal saline, isotonic saline is preferred. The volume 30 ml per kg in patients with sepsis as uh, per surviving sepsis guideline, but you can use lower uh, 
rates of fluid and sea fluid responsiveness. There is no clear number. You can decide based on patient. Sepsis causing perennial AK, very unlikely. It causes mostly intrinsic AK. Prerenal azotemia in patients with underlying CKD and hypertension, which is poorly controlled. Uh, good question by the selling. Don't fear fluid. If there is no pulmonary congestion, go ahead and give fluid anyway. Even if the patient has CKD or uncontrolled hypertension, it has nothing to do with uh, the loss. Still, these are the patients. Even this underlying CKD in patients with poorly uncontrolled hypertension are the ones you should give fluid for because these patients are uh, at the most risk for AK. Many, many people are asking for indications for uh, dialysis. One is hyperkalemia in patients with no urine outputs or in your, if they have urine output, it's refractory. And there is refractory fluid overload despite maximum dose of diuretics, uremia, uremic symptoms like encephalopathy and bleeding, uremic bleeding, gastropathy. These are uh, metabolic acidosis is also another indication. Many patients are. Uh, many uh, physicians are asking. Uh, Aiden has asked about competitive secretion of PPI. We don't need those adjustments for PPI, uh, but omeprazole has been shown to cause uh, interstitial nephritis. Complete, uh, competitive secretion is very minimal. We don't need those adjustments for complications. How do you uh, escalate those of classic pulmonary edema? That's a good question. Uh, so just like patients with heart failure, you give a certain dose. You start with higher dose in AKI because of diuretic resistance. So start with 80 mg in this kind every two to four hours based on urine output. And you can reach out uh, a diagnosis. Another excellent question from Aviot, duration of antibiotics after renal adjustment. Do we count the number of days or the number of dose? We count the number of days. Because if you adjust, you are assuming that, for example, if you adjust vancomycin every 72 hours, you are assuming that the vancomycin stays in the system for 72 hours. So you can't count the days. The dose doesn't matter because the renal clearing ability is the one that is affected. Uh, so it's better to uh, count the days. You are assuming the drug will stay for a uh, longer period of time in patients with AK. Ledet Kizacho has asked uh, IV contrast benefits. Uh, so in con to prevent contrast-induced nephropathy, you can give IV fluid before and after the contrast. And clearly, this has been shown to prevent contrast-induced AK, uh, definitively. Very effective in preventing uh, uh, contrast-related acute kidney injury. Normal saline administration before and after contrast use. Uh, Aviot, another excellent question. Renal biopsy is really done. So glomerular disease is um, very difficult to manage where there is no biopsy, but you can manage clinically. It's better to refer for uh, management with senior internist or uh, anyone that has experience with glomerular disease. That's also our concern that many glomerular diseases are uh, being uh, not being managed properly depends on the cause of glomerular disease. So I'm not going to that. Another question, uh, Ali. So is it recommended to initiate steroid in RP gene without renal biopsy? Definitely. If you have RP gene, start steroid and another immunosuppressive agent like cyclophosphamic. If clinically it's RP gene, biopsy is very difficult to access in many resource limited countries. So just go ahead and start steroid. That's the most important in treatment uh, of RP chain. Even we start without renal biopsy, renal biopsy might be delayed sometimes, so you have to initiate steroid as soon as you diagnose RP chain. At least IV steroid, if not very high dose P of steroid. Okay, so my, my emphasis is that AK is uh, preventable, so we should start thinking about fluid and uh, preventing further damage early. So in whatever setting you are working on, 
uh, it's better to individual experience and try to prevent further damage instead of worrying when creatine is greater than four or five it's better to worry if it when it's 1.5 so as early as possible try to worry about food management electrolyte management in the underlying condition also uh, as a summary please please focus on the underlying condition and uh, all the other measures are uh, supportive. So thank you for uh, the opportunity, Blue Hills, and thank you all of you for attending and for being eager, attentive, and asking all these questions. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much.